today, we are beginning a new series that's going to take us through at least June 16th, and we're calling the series Strange Things from Golgotha to Pentecost. And this uh, series is going to look at a number of interesting things, a number of strange things that occurred from the time of the death of Jesus uh, through the day of Pentecost. If you're not uh, familiar with this, the day of Pentecost occurred 50 days after the resurrection of Christ. And so we're talking about a period of 53 days or so uh, from Christ's crucifixion until the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of of Pentecost. Now, I'm not going to promise we're going to cover every single event that happened in those, uh, in those days, but we are going to cover most of the interesting things uh, that happened during that time period. You know, there's always a lot more going on in our world than what we understand with our natural mind and with our natural eyes. In the scientific age that we live in, we have convinced ourselves that everything has a natural explanation. Our Western, scientific, modernist ways of thinking have convinced us that what we can see and explain is all that there is. But that is not true. There's way more going on in our world, way more going on in the universe than what can fit into our neat and tidy boxes of our Western scientific modernist ways of thinking. And so this series is going to address some of those sorts of things that occurred from the time of the death of Jesus uh, through to the day of Pentecost. Supernatural things, things that cannot be explained from a natural scientific perspective, but things that are nevertheless very, very real. And so I want to go straight to our text as we uh, kick off this series. We're going to look at Matthew 27, 45 through 56 today. If you like to follow along in your Bible, you can uh, turn there real quick. It will be on the screen uh, behind me. And uh, here's, by the way, I haven't told you this in a long time. If you need a Bible and you don't have one, uh, there is a little bookshelf at the back of the sanctuary. You're welcome to help yourself to a Bible. And if you ever uh, come to church, want your Bible during the service, but forgot your own, you're always welcome to stop by and use one of those Bibles. So here's what we find in Matthew 27, 45 through 56. From the sixth hour until the ninth hour, darkness came over all the land. About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing there heard this, they said, He is calling Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and got a sponge. He filled it with wine vinegar, put it on a stick, and offered it to Jesus to drink. The rest said, Now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At that moment... The curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks split. The tombs broke open and the bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs and after Jesus' resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many people. When the centurion and those who were, uh, guarding, who were with him guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified and exclaimed, surely he was the Son of God. Many women were there watching from a distance. They had followed Jesus from Galilee to care for his needs. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of uh, James and, and uh, Joseph, and, and, and the mother of Zebedee's uh, sons. Now, it's not part of the message today, but I thought it was worthwhile to highlight that the people still with Jesus at this point are the women. All of the men have fled. God bless the women. God bless the women. So, uh, we see in these verses a number of uh, strange things, a number of very strange things that occurred. They're all right there in the reading. We already uh, read them, but I want to briefly highlight these strange events that accompanied the death of Jesus. The first strange thing we find is in verse 45. 
we find that darkness came over all the land from the sixth hour until the ninth hour. Ladies and gentlemen, the special effects department of Vineyard Christian Church. You cannot get this at most churches, this kind of, this level of special effects. Okay, we can bring them back up now. I think we've made our point. All right. So, Steven Spielberg, eat your heart out. All right. So, darkness came over all the land from the sixth hour to the ninth hour. Now, this is strange because if you do not know, the sixth hour of the day for the Jews was noon. And the ninth hour of the day was three in the afternoon, not a time when it is supposed to be dark. And I'm told that since with the crucifixion happening at Passover and Passover occurring at a full moon, this could not have been a solar eclipse. So not a time when it's supposed to be dark and no natural explanation for why it became dark at this particular time. The second strange thing we find is in verse 51. We find that at the moment of Christ's death, there was an earthquake that was of enough force that it caused rocks to split open, caused the, the ground to split open. So it's dark when it shouldn't be, and now the ground begins to quake and rocks begin splitting. Now, certainly there are natural explanations for earthquakes, but the timing is a bit interesting. The timing is sort of coincidental. Uh, by the way, according to Stephen Austin of Cedarville University, there is geological evidence of two earthquakes occurring in Jerusalem in 33 AD, believed to be the earthquakes that accompanied the death of Christ and then the resurrection of Christ. All right, now we're already in strange territory, but now it gets really strange. The third strange event that accompanied Christ's death, according to verses 53 and 54, is that tombs broke open, and the bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. And then following Christ's resurrection, these resurrected people went into Jerusalem and appeared to many people in Jerusalem. Michael Wilkins, Dean of Faculty and the Professor of New Testament Language and Literature at Talbot School of Theology at Biola University, my, that's a mouthful, explains that the way this verse should be understood is that the tombs broke open at the death of Jesus, but then the people in the tombs were not raised to life and did not come out of the tombs until after Jesus' resurrection. And so it's at that point then that they went into Jerusalem and appeared to many people, but he, he at least claims that the tombs would have broken open uh, even before the resurrection. Now, this is an extremely strange thing to imagine. It's an extremely strange scene. It is understandable why someone might struggle with the story, believing the story. But remember, our faith itself rests on a very strange story, which is that Jesus rose from the dead. And even before Jesus had risen from the dead, we know from the record of the New Testament that Jesus had raised Lazarus from the dead, had called him out of the tomb, had called him from among the dead. And so while a really strange thing is recorded here, it's not like we aren't already dealing with a whole lot of supernatural stuff within the Bible, including within the Gospels. And so you put all of this together and you've got quite the picture. Darkness everywhere when it should not be dark. Earthquakes, splitting open rocks, splitting open the ground. Now tombs are open. And if Wilkins is right, then these tombs are open uh, from, from uh, the death of Jesus until his resurrection. 
So the tombs are like open for three days. And then sometime around the resurrection, the people in these tombs actually come to life. And like Jesus, they then begin showing themselves to people. Wilkins says the tombs breaking open might be a prolipsis of the resurrection of Jesus. Now, if you don't know what a prolipsis is, it is okay. I did not know what a prolipsis is either until this week. But what a prolipsis is, is basically a representation of something existing before it actually does exist. And so he speculates that the tomb's opening at the death of Christ is pointing uh, to the opening of the tomb of Christ three days before it actually happens. The fourth strange thing we see is found in verse 54. And that's when a Roman centurion and soldiers under his command are guarding Jesus at the cross. They're there at his death when all of these strange things occur. And these Roman soldiers exclaim, surely he was the son of God. Gentile, pagan, Roman soldiers begin to see the truth about Jesus even as his lifeless body hangs on the cross in front of them. And then the fifth strange thing, which is the title of my message today and is found in verse 51. At the moment that Jesus gave up his spirit and died, we're told that the curtain of the temple was torn into from top to bottom. Now, I'm going to say more about this in a minute, but for now, I want to make sure you understand that the curtain of the temple that is referred to here is the curtain that separated the area of the temple called the holy place from the area of the temple called the holy of holies or the most holy place. The temple at the time of Christ had an outer court, which is where the priests and Levites ministered to and on behalf of the people. And then from the outer court, only the priest could enter into what was called the holy place. And within the holy place, there were three articles of furniture. There was the golden lamp stand, which burned continually and gave light to the holy place. There was the table of showbread, which contained bread that was baked fresh every day and that only the priests were allowed to eat. And then the final article of furniture was the altar of incense, where offerings were made to the Lord both morning and evening. Each of those things have significance that we're not going into today. But the holy place was set apart as a special representation and reminder of the presence of God in the middle of his people. And then at the back of the holy place was a smaller chamber called the Holy of Holies, or the Most Holy Place. And in this area was housed the Ark of the Covenant. And on top of the Ark of the Covenant was a special area that was called the Mercy Seat, which was viewed as the throne of God. It was the place where the presence of God dwelled. Now, God has always been, and he was at this time, omnipresent. But this location was seen as a special place where there was a special manifestation of the presence of God dwelling in the middle of his people. The Holy of Holies could only be entered by a human being once a year. Only the high priest could enter on this one day of the year, a day called the Day of Atonement. And he could only enter with a blood sacrifice to sprinkle on the mercy seat. I'm told that he had to enter with smoke from the altar of incense uh, uh, being in the Holy of Holies to shield his view of the ark as he sprinkled the blood on it for the sins of the people. If anyone entered this chamber when they were not supposed to, or if they entered the chamber without going through the proper steps before they entered, or they entered and, oops, I forgot the blood... They would die. They would die. Now it's been said that uh, they would place uh, bells on the bottom of the priest's robe uh, before he went in so that as long as they heard the bells uh, 
What do bells do? Chiming? <laughs> Clinking? <laughs> jingle. Bells jingle. Jingle bells, jingle bells. That's right. All right. So, so, uh, so as long as they heard the bells jingling, they knew the priest was okay. But if the bells stopped jingling, they knew the priest had done something wrong and he was dead. And I'm also told that they would tie a rope uh, around his ankle so that if he died, they could pull him out without anyone having dinner. I wanted to illustrate this today. <laughs> but, but I imagined pulling someone across this carpet with a rope around their ankle would not work very well. So, so we just went with the lights thing. We just went with the lights thing. But, but this is what uh, I'm told that they would, would do. And, and here's something that's important. The temple emphasized the, that the presence of God was in the middle of his people. He was there and he could be accessed at the same time. The point of the holy place and especially the most holy place was to emphasize God's holiness and his inaccessibility due to the sins of the people. That he could only be approached in this certain way once a year. And so this is the curtain that was torn in two from top to bottom. It was the curtain that separated the Holy of Holies and the holy place and separated the Holy of Holies from the rest of the temple as well. It was the curtain that separated the presence of God from the people. Darkness, when it shouldn't be dark. Earthquakes. Tombs of the dead opening. Pagan soldiers beginning to see the truth about Jesus even though he's hanging lifeless in front of them. And the curtain of the temple torn in two from top to bottom. Strange, very strange things. Strange events that accompanied the death of Jesus. But what is the meaning of the strange events? Each of these strange occurrences served as a confirmation of Jesus' identity and Jesus' mission. The darkness and the earthquake serve as the confirming testimony of creation. William MacDonald writes, The death of God's Son produced tremendous upheavals in nature as if there was an empathy between inanimate creation and its creator. Michael Wilkins, the darkness displayed God's displeasure with humanity for crucifying his son and God's judgment on the sins of the world. The testimony of creation. The opening of the tombs resulted in the confirming testimony of the righteous dead. Michael Wilkins says those rays were likely heroes and martyrs from Israel's history selected to bear miraculous testimony to these events. Confirming testimony from the righteous dead. And then verse 54 is the confirming testimony of a pagan soldier. Persuaded about the identity of Christ because of the confirming testimony of creation that he was witnessing. While the centurion couldn't possibly have understood the full impact of, of all that he was witnessing. And couldn't possibly have understood the full impact of this, this step of faith that he was taking. His explanation, surely he was the son of God, should absolutely be understood as an initial step of faith. All that he witnessed convinced him that Jesus was more than the Romans thought he was. Convinced him that Jesus was more than who the Jewish leaders said that he was. He really was the Son of God. And then, in addition to the confirming testimony of creation and of the righteous dead and of the pagan soldier, there is this confirming testimony from the temple. Verse 51. At that moment. 
the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. At the, at the moment that Jesus died, at that moment, the curtain was torn in two. And you need to understand that this was no small curtain, okay? This was not a small curtain. The curtain was 60 feet high and 30 feet wide. So it was about half the width of this room. And it was about, what, uh, about four times, three, three and a half, four times the height of the highest peak of this room. This was an impressive curtain. It was woven of 72 braids, each with 24 threads. And I'm told that the thickness of the curtain was a hand breadth, which means that it was basically the width of a human palm. So this isn't like a thin little sheet or even a, you know, <laughs> slightly thicker blanket. This is a massive piece of material of the width of a person's uh, palm. It was an amazing curtain. It was a heavy curtain, and it was meant to hold up. It was meant to separate the Holy of Holies from the rest of the temple and from everyone except for the high priest that one time a year. It was this curtain that was ripped in two from top to bottom. All of these events are extraordinary supernatural testimonies that confirm that Jesus is who he claimed to be and that his ministry stands vindicated before the nation of Israel. These things are supernatural confirmations of Jesus' identity and Jesus' mission. But it's this final confirming testimony, the torn curtain, that is our focus for today. And before we consider the meaning of the torn curtain, I want to point out something that I, I just discovered, just thought, thought about this week, and uh, it, it was brought to my attention that really is pretty incredible. <clears throat> and that is that it was only the priestly aristocracy that would have known about the torn curtain. It was hidden. Nobody else could see this. And so how do we even know about it? How do we even know about it? Why wouldn't the curtain have simply been repaired and no one ever known the difference of this amazing thing that confirmed Jesus' identity and mission? Well, some of you are probably well ahead of me. Acts 6-7 tells us why. We read in Acts 6-7, So the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly. And a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. This large number of priests that became obedient to the faith would have told the believers what happened in the holy place. But how amazing is it to realize that this conversion of a large number of priests is very likely attributable to the confirming testimony of the torn curtain. They knew what had happened and it cracked open or it kicked wide open the doors of their hearts to receive Christ as Savior and Lord. What an, what an amazing, what an amazing thing. So what is the meaning of the torn curtain? Yes, it's strange. Yes, it's interesting. But what's its meaning and significance? The tearing of the curtain testified that Jesus' sacrifice on the cross fulfilled the hopes expressed in all of the years of Israel's temple sacrifices. In other words, Jesus' sacrifice was what all the temple sacrifices that had happened before foreshadowed. The temple sacrifices, the entire sacrificial system, had simply been symbolic of the coming of the ultimate sacrifice, Jesus Christ. And so what this means is that the tearing of the curtain was a declaration that no more sacrifices were required. No more were required. The tearing of the curtain testified that Jesus is the great high priest whose sacrifice has permanently satisfied God's wrath 
against humanity's sin. No more sacrifice is required because the wrath of God against sin has been fully satisfied through Jesus' death. And so ultimately, the torn curtain signifies the removal of the separation between God and man. What it tells us very clearly, what it tells us very clearly is that we are no longer estranged from God. We're no longer estranged. Remember what happened in the beginning when sin entered in the world. Mankind went from being friends with God, having a direct relationship with God. The Bible talks about they walked in the cool of the day with God. They went from that to being estranged from God, separated from God. It's so bad that Paul said we became enemies of God. The torn curtain means that there's no more enmity. There's no more estrangement. There is no more separation. The penalty for our rebellion has been fully paid. The wrath of God against mankind has been fully satisfied. There is no longer anything keeping us from direct fellowship with the living God. So the curtain that kept sinful humanity separate from the presence of God, the presence of holy God, is torn from top to bottom, an obvious act of God, because God once again welcomes us into the kind of direct personal relationship with him that Adam and Eve had and lost in the beginning. And so here's what the torn curtain practically means for you. And for me, we now can confidently approach God. We can confidently enter into the presence of God by the blood of Jesus, which paid the price for our sins and satisfied God's wrath against mankind, God's wrath against us, God's wrath against you, God's wrath against me. Hebrews 19, I'm sorry, Hebrews 10, 19 through 23 say it this way. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, open for us through the curtain, that is his, Christ's body. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, Jesus, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess for he who promised is faithful. Remember the care that had to be taken to enter the presence of God. Bells on the robe. Rope tied to the ankle. Everything had to be just right. The smoke had to be there to shield, uh, to shield the priest from fully seeing the mercy seat. He better not forget to take the blood in with him. Great precision was required. Everything had to be done just right. But now with the tearing of the curtain, because of the blood of Jesus... What God says to you and to me is whatever condition you're in. I don't care. I welcome you to come directly into my presence. You don't have to clean yourself up. You don't have to go through any ritual. You don't have to tie a rope around your ankle. You don't have to place bells on the bottom of your pants. Come as you are, however you are, and I will welcome you. Jesus has satisfied my just demands, and so now you can boldly approach me, no matter your condition, and I will welcome you. You don't need a priest to represent you to God anymore. You don't have to go through a pastor to get to God. God welcomes each and every one of us just as we are 
to confidently come to him for whatever we need. The only mediator we need is Jesus. No other mediator is needed. Jesus, our great high priest, has given us direct access to God. What do you need? Do you need forgiveness of sins today? You can confidently approach God. Do you need freedom from depression today? You can confidently take your need before the throne of God. Do you need direction for your life? You can confidently approach God. Need courage for the trial that you're facing? You can confidently approach God. Whatever your need, God welcomes you into His presence. Whatever your condition today, God welcomes you into His presence. It's because of Jesus. You are fully welcomed into the presence of God. You are invited to come to Him with confidence no matter your condition or need. The presence and power of God is available to anyone who will simply come to Him because of what Jesus has done for us. I think there are some of us here today who have been keeping our distance from God. And you know, you can keep your distance from God even while being in church. You, you can. Some of us, I think, have been keeping our distance from God. Maybe it's because we're ashamed of something that we've done. Maybe it's because we've failed God yet again. And we have allowed the enemy of our soul to convince us that like Adam and Eve were barred from the Garden of Eden, our sin, our failure has put God off limits to us. If you've been keeping your distance from God, my hope today is that this strange story of the torn curtain will remind you today that you can confidently come to God. You can confidently come to God no matter the condition of your life today. You can confidently come to God no matter what need you have, even if the mess that you have to bring Him is of your own making. This is what Jesus has accomplished for you and for me through His death on the cross. The curtain is torn, and so God welcomes you to come directly to him, just as you are. Let's stand. If you would, just bow your head.